Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Woman Chica. Welcome. Great to see everyone here. It's a great echo going on. I'm not sure why, but um, maybe you guys can work some more magic. Um, wonderful to have you all here. Um, for, uh, I guess speaker here, um, Paul Coops is joining us all the way from Calgary, which we determined earlier was about a 60 degrees centigrade turnaround from where he would be at the moment. Um, but first, uh, let me start by acknowledging the traditional owners of these lands, the lands of the Wundery people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respect to elders past and present, extend that courtesy to um, the elders of other lands who are um, joining us online. Um, and also extend that respect to our First Nations colleagues present here. I'd like to welcome Paul. Um, it's really wonderful that you're able to join us for the first time visiting Wehi or extended Wehi in this particular circumstance, but um, uh, great to have you. And also thanks to the ASI because you're visiting as a part of the visiting speaker program and it's really kind of them to share you with us. Um, now, Paul is, I'm sure you're all familiar, has a, a very long CV, so I'm going to keep it, the introduction brief, but um, I believe you're the um, inaugural director of the Schneider Institute at the University of Calgary, and now you're a professor there, um, and Paul's made amazing contributions to understanding infection, immunity, and inflammation, and uses some really cool um, imaging methods, which we're going to hear about today. So I won't take any more of your time, and uh, please join me in welcoming him. Okay, well, uh, thank you. This is my first time at WeHi, so I'm really excited to be here. This is really cool to be able to speak to you. Um, I'm going to give you three different talks, okay, all at once. Uh, just, um, just to give a flavor of the things we do. And I know different people study different things, so hopefully you'll all be able to find something worthwhile in all of this. Um, and we study the innate immune system, and we're very interested in neutrophils and macrophage. And today I'd like to tell you that the macrophage aren't in your body to cause you disease. And they're actually very important in homeostasis. And until we understand that, it's hard to treat disease and understand how does, where the macrophage go awry. The other point I wanna make uh, is that um, for many years, we've studied immunology in a silo. And we study physiology in a silo and we study anatomy in a silo. And what I'd like to say today is I'd like to try and press upon you the integration between physiology and immunology. And for example, if you think about the brain and the microglia, the macrophage of the brain, they prune neurons. That's got to be part of physiology, right? And in the lung, they move around and they remove surfactant to make sure that you can continue to breathe properly. So they're absolutely integral for everything we do. And as a good beer drinker, I'll start with the most important macrophage in your body, uh, which is the uh, Kupfer cell. It lives in the liver. It's the largest uh, population of macrophage in your body. And you may wonder, well, why is he studying the Kupfer cell? What possible reason could there be to study the Kupfer cell? And so you take five times 10 to the seventh staph aureus, inject it into the bloodstream. And you can see here your favorite organs, spleen, kidney, lung, blood. You don't find much. But if you look in the liver, you find a lot. And it's the liver that after each meal, if we get any bacteria into the bloodstream, sequester those bacteria, and you don't die of sepsis after every meal, okay? Uh, you break your barrier by drinking a few beers, a few and you don't die of sepsis. So these macrophages are critical and you need to understand the physiology of the liver. And so there's blood flow that comes from the gut, for example, trickles through these tiny little sinusoids and then leaves again. And inside these sinusoids are endothelial cells. They make holes, they're fenestrated. And in addition to that, there are these large macrophages, the Kupfer cells. They live inside that vasculature, one of the few macrophages that lives inside the vasculature, okay? 
And we can see this and we can look at this. And so we use uh, all kinds of different imaging modalities. Uh, uh, I, I won't um, belabor the different systems we use. I'll use a little bit of two photon, a lot of spinning disc in this talk. But what I wanna say is that we take the mouse, we put it on a pedestal. If we need to do anything to it, we just try to do as little as possible. We'll do a little laparotomy if we need to visualize the liver directly, or we'll try and image right through the wall of the abdomen and try and visualize what's happening in these organs, okay? We take antibodies and put them into the mouse bloodstream. We never ever take a cell out and label it, okay? Because like it or not, that changes the biology of that cell. And so, that's what we do. And then that liver microcirculation that I showed you looks like this in our imaging. So you can see, is there any chance we could shut the front lights off? You can see it for the most part. It'd be great if, uh, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> All right, uh, anyway, there might be. Yeah, just afraid to touch any. There's so many things. Ah, there we go. Thank you kindly. All right. So now you can see the blue are the sinusoids. Okay. Green are lymphocytes. In this case, INKT cells trafficking around all the time, moving around. And the cells I want to talk to you about are the big purple cells. Okay. These are the Kupfer cells sitting right inside the vasculature. They certainly make contact with the outside. And I'll talk about that. But these guys, their job, if you inject, a bunch of green bacteria is to catch them. Okay, that's what they do. All right. And it's really quite a spectacular system because they reach in and they'll just grab what they need and not everything else. And they do it because of a complement receptor that you may not be very familiar with. So the complement receptor CR1 to CR4 are not involved in this process. They cannot catch underflow conditions. They require a catch bond to catch those bacteria. And that comes from this molecule right here, Crig. Crig catches those bacteria by binding to complement on the surface and, bring, and internalizes it into the Kupfer cell. Crig was originally discovered by, uh, by uh, Menno van Lucren campaign at Genentech. Uh, and he proposed this molecule might be very important for catching underflow. And he was absolutely right. We've worked with him in the past. Uh, you, you catch bacteria here. If you remove Kupfer cells, you don't catch bacteria. And if you don't have Crig, you don't catch bacteria. Okay. <clears throat> now, what I want to talk to you about today is this fascinating thing that begets a Kupfer cell and not a microglia and not an alveolar macrophage. How does that all happen? And so if you think about it, you have this tissue macrophage. So it's a progenitor cell with a certain program. And then it seeds all these different organs prior to birth. It sees different uh, molecules activates different transcription factors to become the macrophage that it becomes. And this has been worked out very nicely in the liver by uh, Guillaume's group in Belgium. He said, look, this monocyte or monocyte progenitor comes in, binds to the sinusoid, reaches out and touches the hepatocyte. And the hepatocyte says, you're in the liver. It then touches this green stellate or fibrotic like fibrosis um sorry fibroblast like cell okay and it says you're in the liver and each one of these transmits messages that activates certain transcription factors that ultimately beget this particular macrophage that you see here in purple you can actually see it reaching out so i've got a few arrows here just showing that it does reach out into the interstitium and it touches other cells and you say, can you show me it touching other cells? The answer is it's tough because here are the stellate cells with a stellate cell report. And you can see they're intertwined everywhere and the Kupfer cells reach out and almost certainly touch them. Great to be able to directly visualize that and we're trying to do some of that. So that is physiology 101 for the liver as far as bacterial infections go, all right? Now I get up fellow from uh, Germany. He's a hepatologist and he ruins my world. He says, my patients don't look anything like your six week old mice, right? 
And there's a problem. My mice are kept in SPF position uh, conditions. They never see viruses, okay? They've never had a drink, right? They don't eat fatty foods. And so they aren't getting any fibrosis. But everyone in this room, believe it or not, you're all on your way to fibrosis. Some of you will outlive it, some of you won't. And so we're all on this spectrum from a totally pristine liver all the way to cirrhosis. And so Moritz wanted to study this and understand what happens as the liver uh, becomes fibrotic, what happens to the immune system? Does it change? Does it respond? Okay. And I'm not suggesting the immune system's causing this fibrosis, not in this model. It actually has to respond to the changes. Okay. And so the model he chose, he used many different models. And the one that he liked the best, although they all sort of recapitulate some of these effects, was to give these mice a little bit of carbon tetrachloride, which kills hepatocytes specifically. And these hepatocytes uh, start dying. So this is a nice healthy liver and nice sinusoids shown here in black. This is what happens after carbon tetrachloride. You can see the autofluorescence for dead cells. They start uh, contracting their sinusoids. Blood flow still needs to go through there. So it starts forming these large collateral vessels right through the liver, okay? And so you've got spectacular changes in the liver. On the right, okay, Okay, the, the healthy liver, you can see the very nice architecture, okay? But in people who behave in naughty ways, you end up getting less of the sinusoids, more of these large collaterals, okay? And that's just quantified here, smaller sinusoids, so you get larger collateral vessels. And the pathologists will tell you <clears throat> there's a lot of fibrosis here. This doesn't do it justice. And so you use your second harmonic on your two photon microscope and look for collagen. And this is what you see. So you, it, the, here's a nice healthy liver, very little collagen. This is what the collagen deposition looks like here. Every single sinusoid is surrounded by collagen. Okay. Remember, I told you the Kupfer cell has to reach out, touch its neighbors to know it's in the liver. And now what we've done is we've put up a barrier. So this poor Kupfer cell, this is not my dog, folks. Okay. I found it on Google. It's amazing what you can find there. This poor dog cannot reach out beyond these trees, right? Kupfer cell can no longer reach out. And so it looks just like that dog. It looks like these sausages now, instead of being able to reach out and touch its environment. And so during fibrosis, what's happening is these Kupfer cells now are starting to lose contact with their surrounding niche. You're altering it. <clears throat> so that beautiful paper Bernardel and et al. published about Kupfer cells reaching out, getting all kinds of messages, we suspect some of those messages might be lost. Okay? And what we see is that any molecule we look at in these Kupfer cells, whether it be that molecule Krig that was so important for catching, or whether it be this molecule uh, TIMP4, another scavenger receptor, they go down. They're poorly expressed. And these Kupfer cells are starting to lose their Kupfer cell likeness, okay? So normally we think of these uh, progenitor cells coming in, becoming tissue macrophage, and then people say, well, you know, there's some turnover of macrophage. Monocytes come in, they take on an M1 or M2 phenotype, and they do various things to cause disease, okay? That's sort of the uh, digest version of that. And these macrophage here start, or at least these macrophage over here start trying to look like these macrophage. Now you get different turnover of macrophage in different tissues. And so I just, you're probably familiar with this paper, but this is uh, one of our collaborators, Florent Genoux. And what Florent did was he found a reporter that will report on monocyte-derived macrophage, okay? So now what you see is anything expressing MS4A3 turns on red, and you can track monocyte-derived macrophage throughout the life of the mouse. And what he saw was that all monocytes are red, 
okay, appropriately. And then when you looked at microglia, there's no turnover at all throughout life. When you looked at Langerhans or, or even liver Cooper cells, there was very little turnover, okay, under basal conditions. Other organs turned over a little bit faster. We looked in our liver with this mouse, and what you can see is that essentially all of the Cooper cells are, are not red. They're of embryonic origin, okay? So now what happens in our, uh, in our um, fibrotic liver? And if you speak to the powers that be, i.e. the reviewers, they'll tell you that all macrophages get turned over in a fibrotic liver. And we think nothing could be further from the truth. When we use this mouse, what we see is that there are some red Cooper cells now taking hold within these sinusoids, but still the majority of these purple cells are of embryonic origin. And so that's why I can make the conclusion that these cells are not just turning over and being monocyte derived macrophage, they're actually the original macrophage losing their identity and become a different cell. And so that's just shown here, these MS4A3 uh, cells, uh, negative cells, which are embryonically uh, derived, they don't express the molecules you expect them to express. And by default, these little sausages do not catch bacteria the way they should. And so this guy's gonna catch one and there's a celebration, okay? because he's caught in bacteria. Meanwhile, in a normal healthy mouse, all these macrophages would be catching all the time. So clearly the system is impaired. Moritz is now happy with his mouse model. And then he comes to me and he says, I hate mice, this sucks. I don't like intravital. And the reason was because he took five times 10 to the seventh staph aureus again, which is just sublethal, okay? Gave it to a mice and they, all survived. And then when his mice were fibrotic, he expected them all to die. And in fact, most of these mice survived. And he couldn't understand it. And he said, how could this be? I mean, these mice should be dead. And I said, you know, it's interesting. Your patients lived for 30, 40, 50 years with cirrhosis, and they survived for prolonged periods of time. And he said, yeah, okay. So off he goes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know what he said to his buddies in the lab, but, uh, but what he did see was that this liver is still catching. And so there must be some compensation going on in the liver, okay? Something's taking over from those poor catching Cooper cells. And when he looked in the large vessels that were being formed, these large um, collateral vessels, they were absolutely packed with monocytes. CX3, CR1 positive monocytes. And if you looked at their spatial distribution closer up, you could see them inside the large vessels. And then the purple Cooper cells were on the outside. Sinusoids were becoming occluded. They don't catch very well. And now you've got these cells inside the large vessels. In a healthy mouse, you get absolutely no Cooper cells in the large vessels. And the reason why is because the, struct, this, the, the architecture matters. This Cooper cell has to protrude into the lumen and catch any bacterium that flows by. If it were to be situated here, all the bacteria would flow by, okay? In this system, there's all this recruitment of monocytes. They start becoming aphage. Now, the next thing he came to me with, and this was striking, is... He said, Dr. Koobs, there's a Cooper cell right there. Can you see that little tiny red dot up there? Just, just right here. You can see that, right? That's a Cooper cell. And I said, that's nice, but what the heck is that? That's 100 times bigger. And he said, yeah, I see that all the time. Here, 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 here. They seem to form in these large collateral vessels. I said, boy, that's interesting. And he said, yeah, yep, it is. And off he went again. And then he came back and he said, you know, they catch really well. They're like uber Cooper cells, he told me. He's a German, so uber Cooper cells. And he, he said, this is phenomenal. And they're expressing lots of that molecule Krig. So if you look at them now, they catch spectacularly well. 
And so while our Kupfer cells are no longer working in a partially fibrotic or fully fibrotic liver, these monocytes come in, they seem to form these giant cells, and they then are able to way outperform a Kupfer cell. The surrounding architecture also changes. And so if you take a look now, here's where the Kupfer cells live, and all these stellate cells, all these fibroblasts surround these large vessels, and they start imparting messages to these giant cells, and you start getting these giant cell formations. <clears throat> we can isolate these cells. And what we find is that they're multinucleated, okay? Uh, on EM, you can see that. And for the last year, we've argued with reviewers about whether they're giant cells, whether they're clusters of cells. And so I call them syncytia. They're together and they work and they perform a function. Okay, and the function is this, when you have a regular Kupfer cell and you have bacteria flowing through, the Kupfer cell catches, okay? If you have fibrosis, you've got occluded sinusoids, you got collateral vessels, the, back, uh, the Kupfer cell does not catch, okay? What do you do? You form a firewall, okay? And you catch all the bacteria. So it's really interesting adaptation here, okay? And thank God, because, you know, drinking beer is important. And so, so we've adapted to drink beer. Now, I'm being facetious and I'll come back to that. Um, so I'm gonna take you through some of the reviews. This isn't published at all, but the first criticism and the kiss of death is you were using the wrong model, right? And so you reply with all models are wrong, some are useful, and the person gets very upset with you and says, well, no, human models aren't wrong. Why don't you just do a human mouse, a, a humanized mouse, or why don't you do a human? So we went off to three transplant centers, and we asked pathologists, could you stain for Kupfer cells in cirrhotic patients uh, that are having their, um, their liver removed? And the answer was, they have spectacular giant cells. And interestingly, the pathologist said, yeah, we knew this for many, many years. And I asked them, what do they do? I went, I don't know, but they do, they're there. We knew this, right? And so we think these guys adapt and they're able to now catch bacteria. They're, they're these spectacular cells. Uh, they have lots of Krig on their surface. And it doesn't matter whether you induce viral, hepatitis, alcohol or non-alcohol hepatitis. The pathway is the same, okay? Now, <clears throat> reviewer number three strikes again and he says, or she says, this is theoretically impossible. I don't know what that means. <laughs> and so I, I don't know how to answer that, but of course, everything's theoretically impossible until you do it. And so it's, it's happening. So how is it happening? I think they asked. All of you know about giant cells in the bone marrow, macrophage fused via Rankel. That wasn't the mechanism by which this was occurring. Okay, we looked. And so it must be something else. And so we uh, luckily had someone already do the single cell RNA seq for us in exactly this model. And they did it in both mice and humans. And then when we uh, data mined their, uh, their data, what we found was molecules upregulated in the fusion pathway. So actually there are, there's a fusion pathway in these, these molecules, including CD44, CD9, CD36, all came up as important molecules, okay? CD44 turned out to be critical for the recruitment of the monocytes, and I won't talk about that. CD9 seemed to have no role. We inhibited it, it did nothing. But CD36 was really interesting. CD36 was the actual fusion molecule, okay? And so when we looked at CD36 knockouts, they remained as individual cells inside the large vessels, never fused, never formed these large clusters. And so we could then ask, does it matter whether they're clusters or individual cells? And what you can see is these bacteria just flow through these large vessels and these single Kupfer cells cannot catch. And so this clustering is an absolutely essential process to remove bacteria from the bloodstream. Now, 
you, you know, we wondered, well, how could this happen? Why would you get these cells, first of all, adhering in the large vessels? And when they adhere in the large vessels, why would they fume, fuse? And so um, it's well known that, uh, that people with cirrhotic liver disease have a very leaky bowel, and so do our mice. And so we asked what would happen if we perform these experiments either in a germ-free facility or in SPF. And what we observed was that we got very few giant cells forming, whether we used antibiotics or whether we used germ-free mice. And we think what's happening is that the metabolites from bacteria or perhaps microbes themselves binding and activating in these large vessels, they upregulate molecules that then allow these cells to adhere and fuse. Now, nothing in life makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I just want to say that we don't think that we've adapted giant cells to deal with our beer drinking. But, you know, we've been living for millions of years with viruses, hepatic viruses. And this pathway that has evolved to allow us to survive well past uh, child rearing years um, exists. And we just happen to use the same pathway when we perform some lifestyle things like drinking, like uh, eating fatty foods. But really, I think this pathway is there to protect us against viruses and the fibrosis that occurs over time with viruses. So that's the first story. Uh, the next two are much shorter, but I will tell you what I've been doing in, during the pandemic. So some of you know me, so you, but you may not know this. So I did some cloning over the pandemic. And so I have two little twins here that uh, apparently look a little like me. My wife's East Indian and she just doesn't know what went wrong. <laughs> um, all right. So this next, uh, this next little vignette is actually about cell death. I know I've come to the home of cell death and you're not gonna like my cell death. So we take a thermal probe and we touch it to the surface of the liver, we get death, okay? We get death, it's not, it's an explosive death. I'm not sure there's a name for it, okay? But what's interesting is the question we asked about 15 years ago is when you induce that death, does the immune system care? Okay, does the immune system notice traumatic death? And so after killing a thousand cells, and this is propidium iodide in red, this is what the neutrophils do. And this is over two hours. Isn't that amazing? And that happens, right? So you have some cell death and these cells move in, right? And when you do surgery on your mouse, this happens. Uh, and so it's really quite interesting. It's a spectacular recruitment of these cells. They adhere and they run straight towards these dead cells. And you can read about this. We characterized it years ago, showing actually that inflammasome was activated uh, on, in the endothelium. And you end up with chemokine production that uh, very nicely labels the sinusoids. The cells reach a point where that chemokine gradient disappears due to dysfunction of the, uh, of the glycocalyx, okay? And now the cells crawl across uh, platelets towards a second chemoattractant, formulated peptides produced from mitochondria. And so it's a beautiful hierarchy of signaling that allows these cells to arrive at this site, okay? And we published this and all three reviewers said, those neutrophils, they're bad, they're killing. So, you know, you're, when you're down, they punch you in the face. And it took us another seven years to convince them otherwise and to really explain that, you know, not, neutrophils don't always have to be killing, especially when there isn't bacteria around. And so we showed in this paper, that they help to remove debris, that they build new blood vessels, they contribute to the new blood vessels that are built, uh, and they really help in repair, okay? And, and you know, reviewers are never satisfied. So the comment that came back from this paper was, why don't you study a real cell like the monocyte, right? Why are you studying neutrophils? Reviewers are never happy, are they? So we started studying monocytes, okay? And I won't talk about this at all, except to say, 
that monocytes are also recruited into this injury site, but they have a very different spatial uh, distribution. So they surround that injury site. They wait until the neutrophils are done and then they migrate in. 72 hours it takes for them to come in, okay? So that's pretty cool. Uh, and we thought, okay, now they'll become macrophage. I got a new postdoc, Jing Wang, from Professor Akira's lab, assured me she was fantastic. And she came to me with the following result after her first experiment. Dr. Koobs, after one hour, there are macrophage there. I said, but it takes 72 hours to get the monocytes there. So how could there be macrophage there? She said, after 12 hours, there's lots of macrophage there. I thought, oh dear, what do I do? So I did what any good supervisor would do. I sent her off to repeat the experiment a hundred times, kept coming back with the same answer. And so um, she then got sophisticated, took all my monocyte reporters, bred them together. They're all in red, yellow, green, and then the blue are the macrophage. They weren't coming from a monocyte lineage. They were mature macrophage somehow infiltrating into this injury site. <clears throat> I, I immediately panicked, but came up with an answer. It must be the Kupfer cells migrating in, even though we've never seen a Kupfer cell move, right? You start getting desperate. And so we removed all the Kupfer cells and the data still remained negative. Okay. So this was puzzling. Um, she showed that these macrophage arrive very early on. There's quite a few of them there. And then they just increase in numbers, okay? This decrease, as I'll show you, is probably an artifact. They stay there, okay? And if you look at them, you can see them sort of on the surface of that injury. So what do we know? Well, we know they're not Cooper cells. We know they're not, we never saw a 480 positive macrophage, okay, moving through the vasculature. It must be coming from somewhere else, okay? And so um, Jing came to me and she said, did you know that in our peritoneal cavity, there are billions of macrophage? Our peritoneal cavity is just chock full of macrophage. And I said, really? And she said, yeah, yeah, people harvest them all, all the time. There's actually 20,000 papers on peritoneal macrophage. And I said, and what do they do? Oh, they're all for signaling. And so people can do signaling experiments. I said, I bet there's a role for these guys, right? And so um, Jing, being way smarter than me, went on and said, look, this is what, what we're looking for. All our visceral organs are in a peritoneal cavity surrounded by these macrophage. Okay, surely they're somehow contributing. And so she took claudronate and very carefully placed it in the peritoneal cavity. It's in liposomes. And she was able to, for the most part, deplete most of the, uh, most of the macrophage in the peritoneum without disturbing other populations. And now when she looked at the injury, those macrophage didn't arrive. She could wash the cavity, they didn't arrive. And then Rutzel Mitzatov came out with a series of papers that said, uh, well, Rutzlin, Gwen Randolph, various groups, Taylor, they all contributed to this field, showing that those peritoneal macrophage, those large peritoneal macrophage, were actually GATA6 positive. They depended on a transcription factor that got turned on by retinoic acid. And these cells became the cells that we know as large peritoneal macrophage. When we stained for GATA6, sure enough, all those macrophage that surrounded that injury were GATA6 positive. The Kupfer cells were negative. Their function was really quite interesting. The second they hit that injury, okay, they were under null state and they immediately started replicating, upregulated 273, CD206, arginase, all the molecules you associate with repair. And it starts almost immediately and goes way up right away. So these macrophages are there, they cover that area and they start to heal. And we can see that here, here are the macrophage. Okay, and this is kind of cool because some of you are interested in gnats and natosis. This ain't it, okay? And so here are the macrophage. You put in the green dead cells and what these macrophage do is they slowly rip apart these dead cells. And so you can see that happening here. You see these little vesicle particles coming off. 
the macrophage are sitting on top of this injury site, okay? And if you wait long enough, what ends up happening is that you get this covering of chromatin over top of this wound, okay? And if you don't have those macrophage, you don't get this covering of the wound. So it's really a very nice system to put chromatin over top. You know histones are antimicrobial, right? And it protects that layer while it heals, okay? These macrophage also seem to contribute to the whole injury process because you get revascularization over seven days. And if you don't have those macrophage, you don't get very good revascularization. So <clears throat> we um, wanted to image this. And you guys have a phenomenal imaging facility. I, I love what I saw this morning. What we needed to do was simply take a microscope that would go through the abdominal cavity, find the liver, and then image the injury, okay? So we're really pushing the limits. And at first, our imaging was awful. So this is what we could see. Here's the uh, area that we're about to injure with a laser. And you can see, I mean, basically, you can't see anything. So let me just stop that. Uh, what you can see is the incredible flux of cells in that peritoneal cavity. As you're breathing, these cells are constantly moving around, OK? So now I'm going to show you a $2 million experiment. Okay, bought a new microscope. I bought the Leica dive. And what we were able to see now is actual cells instead of just red pixels. And what we were able to see now is the formation of these aggregates. Okay, and you can see that here. Really quite a spectacular aggregate over top of that injury. Okay, and the interesting thing about this actually is that it took exactly 13 minutes. Okay, so you hear about neutrophils being first to a site of inflammation. They get there by an hour. They're really fast. These guys, they, they kick their butts. Okay, these macrophages are getting there fast. And you can see that here within 10 minutes, they're already there. Uh, if you don't let them move, so you form sort of a pouch so there's no movement of fluid, then they can't get to that site at all, even though they're just sitting right on top of it. They need that tethering to attach. And the neutrophils are just barely waking up, okay? We, in fact, did some fun experiments. We raced platelets against macrophage. So we injured a vessel, we injured the vessel wall, and they both got there at the same time. And that's kind of interesting because the platelet and macrophage in primordial organisms was the same cell. And we think that the macrophage is retaining some of the platelet uh, characteristics. We thought maybe it was just platelets leaking into the peritoneal cavity, but when we depleted platelets, it had no effect. This is really the macrophage. Selectins, integrins weren't involved. And um, we ended up actually going back to the primordial organism, the sea urchin, which really has the first original cavity, okay? And it has a macrophage that basically takes care of everything. And so you poke a hole in the sea urchin and they plug it up with these macrophages. We've retained that ability, it looks like, in, in mammalian systems. And what's interesting is that these sea urchins depend on about a thousand different scavenger receptors to, to distinguish self. And so they see different things, uh, charged particles, et cetera, and they react to it. And so we wondered whether the scavenger receptors were at play. Luckily, we don't have a thousand scavenger receptors. I'd be here for a while. Uh, we have only a couple. And these scavenger receptors actually were critical for this activation. So Marco, MSR1, these are critical molecules that somehow are causing this aggregation and they're causing this healing response. And so um, we were able to publish this paper, uh, but you know, this is not our imaging. Uh, this is a cartoon they drew. I was very disappointed, but it's a beautiful cartoon. I just put our imaging. So anyway, there you have it. Um, these GATA6 macrophage, they reach the site at 12 hours, and then it looks like they go away. And the reason why that, that's happening, we think, is that that GATA6, that GATA6 positive macrophage needs retinoic acid. Second, it leaves that niche it loses its GATA6, we can no longer track it. And so just to make a long story short, uh, we made a specific um, 
uh, Lysem Cree GATA6 split base reporter mouse so that we can now report specifically on these GATA6 macrophage. And when we look at this system, we can use tamoxifen to actually activate them and then lineage trace these cells. And I just want to show you that at seven days, at 14 days, you see these spectacular healer cells sitting inside that injury. And they persist there for about 28 days until that wound is no longer there anymore. So they're a very important uh, reservoir. And we think that it's not just the visceral organs. The heart sits in a cavity surrounded by these macrophages. The lung sits in a cavity surrounded by these macrophages. If you have a tumor in your peritoneum, it's surrounded by these macrophages. And so I think these cells may prove to have some very interesting biology going forward. All right, now in the last five minutes, is that okay? Yeah, my last story. And this one comes back to that concept of really knowing physiology and not just putting yourself in a silo of immunology, which is where I normally live. And so I really depended on others uh, like Keith Sharkey and others, physiologists to help me uh, be able to, to really figure this out. And so the question was, again, how do we repair? But the question was a little different this time. It was, how do we repair after a nasty staph infection, okay? I noticed there's a lot of people getting tattoos, okay? So you'll really like this story. So this individual got tattooed, okay? It didn't work out so good. You know, the place looked respectable. They took visa, uh, but it turned out that, uh, that uh, there were some problems. And so he ended up in the hospital with a giant, giant, nasty uh, staph abscess. And people try and mimic this in vivo. And so what they'll do is they'll use 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th bacteria, stick it in there, they go everywhere, and the mice die, or they don't, okay? And I got a new student who told me that that is like dropping an atomic bomb, and we need to figure out a better way of doing this. And so she came to me and she said, you know, most of these infections are through penetration of some form through the skin, shard of glass, splinter, and the staph starts growing on a foreign object. And so she said, when you do that, you reduce the amount of bacteria you need to see a good immune response by about a hundredfold. But Rachel being Rachel said, I'm gonna use 500 CFU, her idea, okay? And I thought, well, okay, that seems like a very little amount. And yet the response was quite interesting because she put it on little agarose beads 500 CFU, uh, sub-Q, and what happened was the staff very quickly grew a biofilm, okay? And now she used our reporter mice, the neutrophil, red mice, the monocyte green mice, and she saw a very interesting pattern just like we do in sterile injury. Neutrophils are the brave ones, they run in. Monocytes, not so brave, they stay on the outside waiting for the neutrophils to do all the work, okay? If you get rid of the neutrophils, all right, you end up with this abscess that actually is just full of bacteria. It leaks through into the lymphatics, gets across, and ends up killing these mice. And so neutrophils are important. Now, if you read reviews on monocytes, what you'll find is that neutrophils kill and monocytes help. And I'm not sure what help means, but that's what it says. And so we did the experiment where we just got rid of all circulating monocytes. CCR2 knockout system has no circulating monocytes. And so now we didn't get that recruitment of monocytes. And it really made no difference at all to the clearance of this infection. So the monocytes were not important for clearing infections whatsoever. <laughs> but they came in. And at about seven days, they migrated in and they became these very, very large macrophage within that injury site, okay? And so there's a common theme here, right? And monocytes come in, they form these large cells. And what are the monocytes macrophage doing there? You guys will be able to tell me because the pictures were so obvious, okay? <laughs> so this is a normal wild type mouse. And this is a mouse that has no monocytes. 
And I think you'll all agree it looks red, right? My four-year-old boys told me that, that that's red. And they're right, it's red, okay? And so when you look at a nice wild type mouse, it revascularizes the wound. You get a nice flow. And when you look at these monocyte deficient mice, you get these huge flow patterns. You get spectacular capillary beds. It's just totally dysregulated uh, revascularization. And so like anybody else, we did single cell. Okay, but when you have staph aureus infection, you get a whole bunch of microbial DNA. We got such a mess that at the end of the day, the data just didn't work. And Rachel said, you know, there's something called Luminex. And I thought, oh dear, that goes back a few years. And it worked beautifully. And so she made a Luminex panel and said, I'm going to look at well, what molecules might be involved. Anybody know which molecule? Only one went up. Anybody? Come on. MMP. What? MMP. MMP. I either get MMP or VEGF. Those are the two that everyone says. All right. Oh. It, was only, it was leptin. Now, you should have seen me scurry back to my office because I had no idea what leptin was. I knew that, uh, geez, if I eat a lot, I might have uh, a lot of leptin. And so I had to go and see Keith Sharkey again and say, hey, Keith, what do you know about leptin? And he educated me. And what we found was that the leptin goes up. And it actually stays up. And you can just get rid of monocytes with an antibody and you see this rise in leptin levels. And it comes from this lipid layer, this hypodermis, okay? And it's made by, uh, by um, fat cells. And what you can see during infection is that this hypodermis expands and then 72 hours later contracts. It's kind of cool because it's actually part of the healing process during an infection. And so you don't think of fat as doing anything in an infection, but it does. And if you don't have those monocytes, the fat gets larger and just stays there. And leptin is not just a dietary hormone. Actually, in 1998, it was described as an important angiogenic factor which is something we just didn't know. And when we gave leptin, we could increase the size of the blood vessels that infiltrated the wound. And if we blocked leptin, we could decrease it. And so then we went to a genetic system. We knocked out leptin receptor on endothelium. And sure enough, we prevented the regrowth. And it was important. VEGF and other things didn't seem to be playing a role. It was this molecule that played the role. <clears throat> so... We had this observation uh, and we wondered, okay, um, why is it that if you don't have monocytes, you get overgrowth? It seemed counterintuitive to what you might predict. And so I said, well, if leptin, I didn't, Rachel said, if leptin is doing this, then there must be an opposing hormone that contradicts leptin's biology. That's exactly what it was. There's a molecule called ghrelin, which when you're hungry, goes up. Leptin goes up after a meal and they counteract each other's biology, okay? There's a beautiful example of how if you discover something in a particular field, dragging it over to another field is not easy. We have to do a lot of experiments to convince people that these hormones are critical for this repair process. In the end, if you give ghrelin, you can prevent some of the biology that you see, the revascularization. And we found ghrelin primarily in monocytes and not the other cells. So it was these monocytes that were coming in and they were causing this to happen. We were asked to make a ghrelin, uh, what, what was it? A monocyte specific ghrelin knockout. And please finish these experiments in six weeks. So you probably have gotten those letters. So someone wasn't really thinking carefully through this. And so we said, well, look, we can do a bone marrow chimera in about 12 weeks, would that work? And they said, yes. And so we did that and we showed that the ghrelin was absolutely critical in the monocytes or at least in bone marrow derived cells. And so <clears throat> this low dose uh, staph aureus infection 
where there's monocyte recruitment, there's neutrophil recruitment, you get this beautiful harmony of cells that interact with the physiology of the system to help in the healing response. And if you now <clears throat> perturb the system, you don't have monocytes, you get hypervascularization, those wounds don't heal. They like paper thin, they don't, you don't get a nice healing, you get lots of red blood vessels that constantly leak. And so uh, Rachel is now in New York City doing a, a postdoc uh, on stem cell biology. And so uh, she's off and running and uh, I wanna thank her for all her hard work for this. And so there are the people that have collaborated with me that have done all the work um, and I wanna thank you for your attention. Thank you. Oh, it's on. It's lucky because I don't know how to operate it. Thanks. That was terrific. Um, you didn't disappoint. I have no questions on the Q&A, but if anyone watching online wants to um, put their well, their question in the chat, please do, and I'll, I'll read it to you. But I can see John already has his hand up. Thank you very much. This is a great seminar. Um, the work that you demonstrated towards the end, but even in the beginning, it reminds me it echoes of the sort of Will Wood work in Will Wood's work in, in Drosophila, where, for example, he shows that fat bodies, so particularly focusing on this end, these very large cells from the fat body mi uh, migrate to wounds and coordinate with hemocytes, which are the macrophages of the of the Drosophila system. So it's a very simple question. Have you any evidence that adipocytes are kind of moving to the site and therefore regulating that way and there's a more involved question if you want have you thought about the that sort of overlap between the drosophila system and and see any other similarities yeah okay so let me start by um by answering the first question um uh, and, and, you know, you've got some of the world's experts in imaging here. And so I don't know how successful they've been in imaging fat, but uh, it's been the bane of my existence. The autofluorescence is spectacular. Uh, it's really hard to image. We've gotten reporter mice for, for adipocytes now, and we would very much like to watch this whole process happen to really be un able to understand how are they contributing because uh, it's, and, and you know, I mean, it's not lost on me that you also get this expansion of fat during cancer, for example. And so we'd really like to understand what's going on here, not just from the staph aureus perspective, but also in cancer and other types of injuries. And so uh, we are going to try and track these cells. I don't know how successful we'll be. It's just really tough. Okay, now the next question. So Mark Davis and I argue about whether mice or humans are important and what's the difference and you want me to go to a drosophila system <laughs> yes right and so i thought i thought going back to sea urchin was good enough but uh but no we haven't uh i mean that fat body uh issue is a very interesting issue and i i actually think we've got a lot to learn from model organisms and i think that you know the system works this same way we just have to be clever enough to be able to see it and so that's a really good point about the drosophila system yeah thank you yes um, hold it sorry okay hello that was fantastic um just two questions this second bit and a third bit the garda six macrophages you said uh have a retinoic acid dependency do, do people with vitamin, vitamin a deficiency have any problem in this population and does that have any you know uh, downstream effects yeah um so i i i don't know the answer to that um um it's a really good question we've started harvesting uh these macrophages from different patients it's really hard to get and the reason why is that the second you get inflammation in the peritoneal cavity they disappear on us we can't find them and that happens in the mouse as well. You can put in LPS and they disappear and all you're left with is the monocyte derived macrophage. So we've started harvesting them from the different patients that come in for hernia operations or you know, gallbladder or things of that nature. We've been harvesting them and we've been looking at them. We're trying to understand what molecules they make, but I don't know what they would look like in a vitamin A deficiency. 
Uh, patients do get atra, which is uh, the opposite. I guess they get a lot of retinoic acid. It might be interesting to look at that as well. Uh, but I have not thought about vitamin A deficiency at all. Uh, that's really cool. I got to ask when I get back you know, whether it's doable. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. I was wondering in your 36 knockout mice, so you prevent to do this fusion of the macrophages in the liver. So now do the mice die after the infection? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. So that was one of the easy ones to knock out of the ballpark. So we did the experiment and they do die. About 80% of them died. Uh, and they died almost as effectively as if you didn't have Kupfer cells in a, in a wild type mouse that doesn't have fibrosis. So they die quite a bit. Um, and so we think that fusion is absolutely critical. We also went on to do experiments where we showed it was the CD36 just on the macrophage, not on the endothelium. And often people will ask me about that. So we think it, uh, it's critical for just that fusion process. And without it, you just can't catch bacteria very well. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's more questions out there. I've got one online. On the way, I'll ask. Um, so Raj online has asked, what, would you propose a similar mechanism of giant macrophages in TB infection? And I wondered why Staph aureus, is it because it's so easy to image because of the color or is there another reason? So, um, uh, yeah, we only got about 14 pages of reviews for this paper and I was working on it this morning to finish it up. Uh, and one of the questions was, do you get these giant cells in the lungs as well? Not in this model, not in the liver model. Not sure why they asked, but we did that. Not in that liver model. Now, the question you're asking is, do you get these giant cells induced by TB? And, you know, we think maybe you do. Uh, you know, they're a granuloma formation. People talk about these giant cells in, uh, in TB. So maybe it's the same thing. What's interesting about our model is there's no infection there to begin with, and yet they form these giant cells. And so it's not induced by a bacteria per se. I think it's activation of endothelium that it recruits these cells. But in a TB model where you've got an overt organism, uh, I think people have reported that giant cells do form or granulomas, I guess. It depends on what you want to call them. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, just a quick comment. I, I have noted reports on multi-nucleated giant cell formation in uh, bacterial infection by Burkholderia. Pseudomallei, which is a bit of a mouthful, but there's certainly reports on that that might be of some interest to you. But my question was actually, do can macrophage in situ or whatever you, whatever you've decided to call them, can they dissolve once they're formed? Can they reverse? Uh, so we're doing exactly that experiment. What we've done is we found that if you take if you take sorry. If you take the, um, the fibrotic mouse out to about 12 weeks, and then you stop feeding it carbon tetrachloride, what happens is the, um, uh, the fibrosis begins to recede a bit. You don't get all the changes, but you do get some of the changes. Some of the architecture is there to stay. It does shrink a little bit, but there's still these large vessels. And so we're now looking to see what happens at week 20 or eight weeks after this. Will we see a mouse that still has giant cells because there are still large vessels? Or will we see a mouse that has no giant cells because there's no longer these, these uh, giant vessels? So that's what we're trying to sort out right now. Great, so there's hope for um, any any of the, any people who might have uh, overindulged during the pandemic in uh, alcohol consumption. That's great, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, so my question is about the large macrophages. Uh, Two-part question. Have you ever managed to capture their genesis in situ? So do you know actually if it's macrophage that's blowing through vessels and they just accumulate and have it like a platelet would or yeah. if it's more active? Well, so um, I don't know if I can show it. I, those vessels are so plugged with macrophage um, that trying to sort out a fusion event you know, these are some of the things that still, uh, you know, we just can't get at, uh, and it's really frustrating. I, you know, I, I hope to be able to get at it, but uh, at this stage, what well, all we can see is that all these clumps, or between week four and week six, uh, you know, it's filled with blood vessels, and then you're seeing these clumps, and so they must do that, 
and you know imaging for in our system imaging for you know four hours is pushing it so we'd have to be able to image for weeks and we can't do what you do in the brain yeah so what's the similarity between them and the ones described by peter croucher and tree fan and the bone marrow recently their supermax that they've described. I don't know if you've seen that paper. No, I, I haven't seen it. I mean, I, all I can do is comment on what's known about the large cells in the bone marrow, these giant cells, and they require rank L to be formed. Our macrophage had lots of rank L. We were all excited. We thought, okay, well, you know, this also happens outside the bone marrow and it wasn't rank L dependent. So then it took us another year to figure out what it was. Yeah. Do you know if they exchange material between each other or do you think it's just a physical association that doesn't really... So um, uh, what we did was a parabiosis experiment, uh, CD45.1, CD45.2. And what you found was that, you know, so it was red and, uh, red and blue. And what you found was that in many cases, you'd find some red patches, some blue patches, suggesting that they hadn't exchanged material. But at later time points, you could find sort of a fusion of blue-red. And so I think they eventually do become a giant cell, uh, but uh, I think it takes a while. So initially they just form these clumps and I'm not sure it matters whether they are a giant cell or whether they're a cluster of cells, they catch bacteria really well. And that's that's what we're after. Yeah. Okay, we have to wrap up, but one quick question before we all race out to get alcohol and tattoos. Yeah. Thanks very much. Paul, do you know anything about the receptor that's involved in the growing? action. I, I ask that because it's one of the most peculiar receptor complexes. Sure is. And there are receptors in the vasculature and the heart, which are atypical growing receptors that are also receptors for desacyl growth. Yeah. So the answer is going to be even shorter than the question. I don't know. I really don't. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, we took it as far as we could. And, uh, you know, we'd like to continue to pursue this. The reagents are not very good for us for this system. So we're trying to work some of that out. Yeah. All right. We'll stop there. Thanks so much. That was spectacular and great discussion as well, everyone. Thanks. And join, join me in thanking Paul. Thanks, everyone.